So hello again everybody. I thought it would be fun to do a video where I show you guys some of my favorite books and actually what I kind of, my initial idea was that I'll pick one book at a time and kind of tell you a lot about about what I like about each book but some of the requests have been more like, well, what's a list of your favorite books? So I thought, why not do a video where I just try and run through a big list of books and just tell you one or two things that I like about each one of them. So we'll see. I've just, I just went through my bookshelves once and I just picked off the books that jumped out to me as being favorites. And I've got a big stack of them here. And I'm just going to go through them one at a time and we'll see if I'm capable of limiting myself to just one or two comments on each book. Um, and we'll see how many I get through and how it goes. This is just sort of a random collection of books, although I did I did one pass through the bookshelves and grabbed the books I liked, and then I did one pass through the stack of books, and I tried to sort them by general theme so that thematically the books are near each other. Uh, we'll see if that actually worked out. Uh, okay, so here we go. And this, so again, this is in no particular order, and it's not just because something's on here you know doesn't mean it's my absolute favorite book of all time it's just a book that I found in my office today and probably some of my favorites are somewhere else and uh, so they're missing but this should be a, a, a pretty cool sampling uh, this one is called Wikinomics by Don Tapscott this is one of the kind of it's you know it's not about management exactly but it's about the evolution of organizational structures and how management does have to change in the new knowledge economy Tapscott's thesis is basically that the, the dramatic changes in information technology and in, in the, co the collapse and the cost of collaboration has, like in, in his view, shattered the, the pre-existing paradigm of what is an organization. He's saying, don't think of your business as your employees anymore. It's just not like correct. In so many cases, products are created by the customers themselves through social collaboration and everything. Um, I could go on about this one for a while, but I'll try to stop. Wikinomics, Don, Tap, Don Tapsky. Conscious Capitalism, John Mackey. Uh, I actually haven't read this one cover to cover. I, I skimmed it. I've seen many lectures from John Mackey where he talks about this stuff, so I'm pretty familiar with the content. I'm a huge, huge fan of the Conscious Capitalism philosophy. If you don't want to buy the book, watch one of his lectures on YouTube, or I know they're on iTunes for free. He does like this hour-long talk about capitalism and the evolution into conscious capitalism. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, John Mackey is the CEO and founder of Whole Foods Markets. Another management type book, uh, Zappos by Tony. I never know how to say his last name. Scythe. I, Tony, the, the founder and I think still CEO of Zappos. Uh, this is a kind of a fun, easy book. It's somewhat autobiographical from Tony's perspective. Uh, he has a very casual, fun way of writing. And the, the Zappos culture is just... Uh, one that you know I've uh, I've never worked there or whatever from what I understand and from what I see uh, from my experience interacting with the company they have an amazing culture and this guy Tony is a guy that gets what makes a culture amazing so I thought this was a very good book um, the fifth discipline by Peter Sangi uh, this one goes back to the 90s I think this was actually a textbook I had in my degree uh, uh, my undergrad degree which was learning and organizational change and it's funny because I read this, you know, for my classes that I didn't really go to a lot, but I, I, I read this book and then I came back to it, you know, a good seven or eight years after I was out of school and I didn't realize how much it affected me. There was like so many ways of thinking and things that I thought uh, that were true that I forgot I had gotten from here. Um, what the, the, this book is about the art and practice of developing a learning organization and got, I think, the fifth discipline is systems thinking. He's got like five disciplines of like ways to make it so that your organization can always keep learning, which is the competitive imperative in the knowledge economy. And I think the fifth discipline is systems thinking. If that's not it exactly, systems thinking is a huge, um, a huge focus in this book. Um, I remember this is probably the first place I encountered uh, Oh, uh, Schrodinger's cat, that paradox, uh, and uh, there's just good stuff in here. It may be worthy of its own video. Uh, okay, so these two are the Jim Collins books. I think he's got another one now, uh, Built to Last and From Good to Great. Uh, this is, these are just more great books about what it takes to build a sustainable organization and have a good culture. Uh, Collins had a in very interesting research methodology with how he... Um, tried to, to make his case. Uh, his 
objective was to filter out companies that were not just good but that were truly great. It's like um, if you look at the things that every profitable company has in common, there's too many things. It's like every house has a front door, but it doesn't mean that a front door is a you know determining characteristic of the quality of the house, right? So every company that's great has the company equivalent of a front front door. But what's unique about the ones that are truly exceptional and sustainable? So he developed a methodology of trying to go back in time and find companies that were similar and then ended up that had different fates. So companies that were in similar spots and similar industries, and then some that were able to make adaptations, were able to survive for a long time, and others that, uh, that weren't, and try to see what was different about them instead of just looking for what's the highest correlation. So that was a very interesting methodology. And he comes up with a lot of the same answers that, you know, I, some of the other guys get, you know, the value of culture. Um, I don't remember. He's got five or six things. It's been a while since I read these, but very good books. I think the quality of his conclusions is high. Uh, no, I got a lot of management ones. The Future of Management. This is probably one of the favorite books I've read recently. Gary Hamill, um, ranked number one influential business thinker by the Wall Street Journal. I think Amazon recommended this to me. I bought it for some reason. It looked like super boring and stuffy, but this guy really gets it. He really gets how technology changes everything. He does case studies of Whole Foods and WL Gore and Google, I think. Uh, and just, I think, just very, very smart thinking about the future of management from Gary Hamill in this one. Um, ah, predictable success uh, from Les McEwen is a great one. This is about the life cycle of an organization. Um, the, the idea is that when you're small, there are certain things that are important to be successful. And as you get bigger, there comes a point where the opposite of those things is important to be successful. And it's very, very hard to make those adjustments. People, it's easy to forget about the time dimension and the fact that the context matters and that when once you pass some level of scale, the scope and complexity increases to the point where now the same process and procedure and structure that might have hindered your rapid innovation when you were small is required to manage the complexity now that you're big. Very, very interesting phenomenon. Uh, Les McEwen is like a serial entrepreneur type guy. He's worked with hundreds of startups and I think founded dozens of them himself. So this is just like the patterns he's noticed anecdotally. It's not quite as scientific as the Jim Collins stuff, but, but possibly even more profound in the way he understands the time dimension. And actually he has another book called The Synergist that came out subsequently, which I didn't find in my office right now. But the synergist has a model of how people's preferences in a work environment. He calls VOP, Visionary Operator Processor. I love this model. It, like, it's sort of analogous to Myers-Briggs in the sense that like, you can map certain Myers-Briggs personalities to it being a visionary, an operator, or a processor, but it's just focused on, on work styles. I think I'm going to do a whole video on that at one point when I dig that book up again. But anyway, Les McEwen, A Predictable Success. I think this guy is also brilliant. Okay, so now I'm getting more into philosophy. Actually, I'm going to save this one for later. Um, here's The Creative Mind by Henry Bergson. I already did a five-minute video on Bergson and analytical mind versus intuitive mind. Creativity and time uh, is what Bergson is writing about. He's a French philosopher writing in the middle part of the last century. Uh, very cool stuff. Very dense, <laughs> but very cool. This is a thin book. I have not read it all. It takes me like an hour to read two pages, but there's some really cool stuff in here. Uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I read this uh, back in high school uh, in great books class. Um, Viktor Frankl is a Holocaust survivor turned uh, logotherapist, which is the like branch of psychoanalysts that he developed. Um, this is a fantastic book. It has one of my favorite quotes in it, which I um, some of you may have heard on the Raven Foundation radio program I did about love um, that I know Jennifer tweeted about. Uh, Self-actualization is possible only as a side effect of self-transcendence. God, I mean, that's God, A+. Plus. Uh, Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, the Tao of Pooh, I love. Uh, Taoism is very cool philosophy. Um, the way Benjamin Hoff illustrates it through Winnie the Pooh, I think, is both profound and funny and cute and awesome. Uh, there's a great story in here about a stream that, when it's young, is, you know, 
rushing along like quickly like a bubbling brook you know and then it goes through the forest and it gets wider and as it kind of grows older and matures it becomes just a very very gently flowing stream as if to say there's no hurry we'll get there someday and I, I don't know I just love that sort of attitude of being just happy just content with the present moment it's a beautiful thing the Taoist philosophy certainly has a lot to offer about how to how to get in that frame of mind. Uh, I love this book, The Day of Piglet. Uh, Day of Piglet. It's also very good. Um, here's Daniel Pink Drive: The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. Um, sort of management, sort of psychology. Um, I'm probably not really philosophy, but uh, the. Really, his model for motivation is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. He says that those autonomy, feeling like you can choose what you're going to do, mastery, the opportunity to get better at something that you've chosen to do, and purpose, the idea that what you're doing has some meaning that goes beyond yourself, that it matters to other people, that those are the things that really motivate us and not getting paid more per widget. And actually, getting paid more per widget, according to many studies, can decrease the frequency with which creativity happens. Uh, it's very cool stuff. Definitely worth reading Drive from Daniel Pink. <coughs> um, okay, so Murray Rothbard is definitely one of my favorite economists. Uh, he's an economist of the Austrian school. But this book is sort of is more of political philosophy. It's called The Ethics of Liberty. Um, I. I'm a believer in the ethics of liberty. I think that that's what the Declaration of Independence is about. This is very much in the John Locke, Thomas Jefferson Declaration of Independence idea of what ethics is, uh, the ethics of liberty. I think Rothbard outlines it um, very clearly and exhaustively and rigorously in this book. Uh, it's I know it's available at Mises.org as a free uh, HTML and I think like search. Uh, they have it in a lot of formats, including. Uh, um, a free podcast, I think. I highly recommend The Ethics of Liberty and anything by Murray Rothbard, really. <clears throat> um, Debt and Delusion uh, from Peter Warburton. Uh, this book I haven't read in a while. This is pretty technical stuff about what central banks do, but it's a very accurate explanation of the, the way we delude ourselves with our current monetary system and solving all our problems with creating more debt that's not backed by real savings. Uh, so if you want to get into the details and see the numbers and have a guy who's really trained to understand it, explain it to you, uh, Debt and Delusion is a very good book. Um, Henry Hazlitt, uh, so now we're getting into economics here. Um, Henry Hazlitt is an, is an Austrian economist. Murray Rothbard wrote the foreword of this one. This is called The Failure of the New Economics and Analysis of the Keynesian Fallacies. Uh, if you listen to me talk about economics for long enough, you will eventually hear me start to talk about how Haynes, how Keynes was um, not, well, his economics was poor. Uh, his ideas did not, are not internally consistent. They don't make sense. Uh, this is a very rigorous treatment of the Keynesian fallacies. Hazlitt go, Hazlitt goes through a lot of what Keynes has to say line by line and just shows how he clearly contradicts himself on the same page in the same chapter, how the ideas just really aren't workable, and he, of course, all offers the, the correct Austrian alternatives, what I think are correct. I'm always up for that debate, but this is a great one if you're... Um, this, this requires some kind of... Uh, you know, some level of economic literacy to start with, but it's a great way to get into, like if you've taken uh, macro econ 101 or whatever, and you've been exposed to Keynes and the ideas in general, uh, try reading this one and see if it makes any more sense to you, would be my suggestion. Failure of the new economics. Um, this is one of my favorites. This one, uh, the binding isn't broken at all because I bought a whole bunch of copies of these because I think everyone should have one. I'm always looking for people to give them to. Maybe I should do a giveaway. Uh, the Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. This is the history of central banking uh, worldwide, although it focuses, uh, he discusses it worldwide, but it's focused on the, the Federal Reserve System in the United States. Uh, it, this guy uh, has a background in economics, like he definitely understands all of the economics, but it's as much about history and political philosophy as anything else. Uh, 
G. Edward Griffin, you know, some people might call him a conspiracy theorist. He does a very good job, I think, of showing when he's conjecturing about a conspiracy and when he's just reporting facts that are not disputed. So whether you agree with that part at all, it's just a fabulous read to understand the, the, the undisputed parts of the history. It's very well referenced, so it's very clear when he's uh, reporting facts versus when he starts to editorialize a little bit. The creature from Jekyll Island is the Federal Reserve, incidentally, the, the <clears throat> J.P. Morgan and his buddies. Totally wrote that uh, at this little convention they had on Jekyll Island, which is an uh, island off the coast of North or South Carolina or Georgia or something like that. Anyway, Federal Reserve book. Um, ah, here's a little pamphlet called The Austrian Theory of the Trade Cycle uh, with and other essays from Mises, um, Rothbard, Hayek, and others, all great Austrian economists. The Austrian theory of the trade cycle, this is a really great way to get into understanding economic theory. Um, basically, the Keynesian view of the trade cycle is that the, there's this business cycle of boom and bust that's a natural part of the economy because of human animal spirits and uncontrollable passions. And we need the benevolence of central planners and bureaucrats to rein in the exuberance of the economy when it gets over exuberant and to kickstart it when it gets over depressed. Uh, the Austrian theory of the trade cycle is exactly the opposite. It says that, you know, in general, the economy is never in equilibrium, but it tends toward it. And the only time where we get way, way off and have a cluster of error that leads to a, a you know, a collective boom or a catastrophic bust is as a result of the manipulation of the, of the bureaucrats and the central planners. Uh, this intellectually makes a lot more sense to me. And I think empirically, there's, you, you can show that it's more accurate. Um, that's a longer conversation, but just Google the Austrian theory of the trade cycle and you'll get a good essay. Any one by Mises or Rothbard is good, or you can buy this little pamphlet from Mises.org. Um, mystery of Banking is another great book by Rothbard, just talking about the mystery of how fractional reserve banking and central banking work. Lots of great books on this. This is just one, Mystery of Banking by Rothbard. Um, okay, that's enough economics. Uh, here's a cool physics book about time. I'm no expert physicist, but this stuff is really trippy when you start to think about what, when you get into what the quantum and theoretical physicists are, are conjecturing about how the universe works these days. Um, after reading this book, uh, I, I started calling it space-time instead of time, or I, I always call it the space-time continuum now, and it always baffles me. Uh, but basically, physicists are, are quite sure that uh, being at a different point in space is not fundamentally different from being at a different point in time. It's like, what? Um, but physics is cool. Uh, Paul Davies, I, had, I have a friend who is a, has a theoretical physics PhD, uh, and he recommended Paul Davies uh, and some other guys as being the smart people that can write in a way that's accessible to lay people. So I, I definitely enjoyed this one. Um, hmm. Now, this is Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World by Rene Girard. Uh, Rene Girard is the scholar that my mom's foundation or my parents' foundation, the Raven Foundation, is really focused on trying to make his, his work accessible to, to people in general. Uh, he's the originator of what's called mimetic theory. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain it all right now. Uh, this is a theology type book. It's a Christian type book. Um, I... I I don't necessarily identify as a Christian, uh, but Rene Girard's version of Christianity, I'm a big fan of. Uh, anything by Rene Girard, uh, I, I've read most of his stuff. I think it's always fantastic. He's a, he's a, a literature professor and anthropologist turned theologist. And so he applies great insights of studying human culture and of studying human literature. And how, how can we read, um, how can we read the Gospels and other sacred, te sacred texts? Uh, more authentically by understanding those things. Uh, fantastic. Here's another one in the same genre. Gil Bailey is like a disciple or, you know, I don't know if that's the right word, but he studied under Girard. Uh, Violence Unveiled is his version of getting at the same thing. Basically, Gil Bailey is saying there is no such thing as justified violence. There's only violence that's veiled and violence that's unveiled. The way we justify violence is always by telling a myth that conceals the humanity of the victim and establishing our own goodness over and against their badness. And that when we remove that cultural or historical justification, 
all we do is, all we see is violence for what it is, which is something that only ever begets more violence. So it's never justified. So he's talking about the process of unveiling violence, of choosing to stop telling those myths and what it does. He says humanity at the crossroads because he thinks that, uh, now I'm getting too far, might do a whole review on this, uh, but Violence Unveiled by Gil Bailey is another great one. If you're interested in like, if you want to maybe read about Christian ideas, but you're turned off by some of the orthodoxy that you hear about, this is a different way of getting at what I think are important truths that are in there. Not that Christianity is the only way to get there. There are truths that are in really almost every religion. Um, so, uh, so Good Bailey is a good one. Now, just one more in that genre. This is, this is The Joy of Being Wrong by James Allison. Uh, James Allison is another uh, another guy who's writing in the, the René Girard, uh, what's called mimetic theory tradition. Um, this is another book that's pretty dense, but James Allison is just extremely brilliant. He's also uh, a rare uh, combination of being a gay Catholic priest. Uh, and it's just, he's just amazing to listen to. Um, I'll probably try and do another video where I just talk about some of the ideas from James Allison. Again, I'm definitely not a Catholic. He he call, he identifies as a Catholic, even though obviously you know um, some of the Catholic uh, command you know power structure would say that you can't be Catholic and be gay. He says no, you're wrong. You're you're not understanding Catholicism correctly. Um, I don't know. I don't. I'm not going to take a stance on what Catholicism really means, but when he talks about his version of the truth and then the joy of being wrong, I go, wow, that makes a lot of sense. He has a way of explaining the Trinity, which when I tried to understand the orthodoxy of the Trinity, it was like some divine mystery, God in three persons, is it three or is it one? You know, don't ask too many questions. He goes, no, no, there's a reason why they, why that's the, the metaphor and this is why it makes sense. And I, I might do a video on that concept actually because I think it's beautiful. Um, but I'm a huge fan of James Allison, uh, and this is, I think, one of his, his better books, The Joy of Being Wrong. Incidentally, the Raven Foundation, my parents' foundation, is publishing uh, a, an educational series that James Allison created called The Forgiving Victim, uh, Undergoing Jesus. Oh, they're changing the title and I'm getting it wrong. But uh, that's really cool, and um, I'm hoping to actually go through that class uh, at some point. I hope to learn a lot. But on the other side of things, here's The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. Um, maybe, I don't know, I don't believe in, I, I don't say God, I say the universe, right? I'm not, I don't want to take a label as an atheist or a, a not atheist or whatever, but I enjoy reading Richard Dawkins. I think he makes a lot of good points in The God Delusion here. The, the version of religion and the definition of God that he argues so vehemently against uh, is not at all <laughs> the God that James Allison is talking about over here. Even though this guy says Catholic orthodoxy is the way to go, and this guy says religion is like completely wrong about everything, I agree with both of them. They're both great books. Uh, no one has a monopoly on the truth. Um, James Allison probably recognizes that a little more than Richard Dawkins does. Uh, but they both get it, and these are both really good ones uh, that are worth reading. Actually, a different one by Dawkins I didn't pull up is called The Selfish Gene that focuses more on how evolution works that helped me think about evolution uh, in a much more reasonable fashion. Um, it, the, the, the point is that the, the unit of replication is the gene, so that's the only level that uh, natural selection operates on. But it, it's not intuitive to think about that way, so we often assume that there's more intelligence behind evolution than there really is. Uh, so he just, in The Selfish Gene, does a great job of explaining what, what's really at play there. Um, changing gears, uh, here's The Inner Game of Golf by Timothy Galloway. Um, this is a great book on the mental game of golf. This is a guy who just taught himself how to play golf without having any proper lessons, really. And it's just, it, you know, a lot of it is about the power of being, of just training your mind to be aware, uh, be in the moment and be aware. Non-judgmental awareness uh, is like, is an amazing thing to train yourself to be able to do. Uh, good tips on that from Timothy Galloway here in the Inner Game of Golf. Um, this is my favorite golf instruction book of all time, Ben Hogan's Five Lessons. Um, if you're trying to figure out how to break 90 uh, or break 100 or, or break 80 or do anything, like just re this is a really good place to start. There's a lot of different ways to approach 
the golf swing and the mental game is probably even more important, but you just got to get a couple of basic fundamentals down. And Hogan, for whatever reason, the way he explains it and what he does with the pencil illustrations, like I tried a lot of ways of figuring out my golf grip. Uh, and I never understood what I was really trying to do until I read his explanation. I was like, oh, it's supposed to feel like that? And I honestly cut my handicap in half pretty quickly. Uh, ben Hogan's Five Lessons. Um, here's one of my favorite um, poker books. Uh, I was into reading poker theory a lot a while back. I haven't done much recently, but David Sklansky is a very smart guy in the poker world. Uh, this is Holden Poker for Advanced Players. has a lot of very good techniques for how to think about making decisions while you're playing poker. Um, just for the sake of completeness, I got a couple of my favorite works of fiction right here, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. That's polarizing enough. I won't talk about it, but I do love this book. Um, I mean, I'm happy to talk about what I love about it, but I figure most people already know if they love or hate Ayn Rand, so I don't have to tell you. Uh, what's going on there, just expressing my affinity for this book, although I don't think Ayn Rand has like a monopoly on the truth about everything. Um, I do love this book, uh, but probably not more than I love this book. Uh, this has to be my favorite book of all time, Les Mis, Victor Hugo. Um, I, I absolutely adore the musical, but one of the things that's amazing about the musical is how the lyrics capture so much of this very thick book uh, very efficiently and like poetically uh, and, and they're just beautifully in a compelling fashion. Um, so Les Mis is one of my favorite fiction books. For some reason, I also grabbed this off my shelf, How to Read a Book by uh, Adler. Um, this was the first book we read in my senior year in high school AP Great Books class. And we had to like use this method to read every other book. I don't actually recommend reading this book. I don't think it's worth it. But my takeaway from this was read first for understanding and then criticize or judge, right? Uh, so we actually, the class was organized this way. It was so much fun. We would have a section from, we'd have a, well, I, I had it somewhere, Frankel's um, Logotherapy, what's it called? Uh, Man's Search for Meaning was a book we read in that class. All right, hold on, let me get it. <laughs> um, Man's Search for Meaning was a book we read in that class, and there was a specific way that we had to mark up the books uh, we had to do what was called Q's, P's, and C's. So as we, rent, as we went through a section, we'd have to outline each, each fundamental question that the author raises, each proposition that they offer along the way, and then each conclusion that they come to. And so we'd have the first day of discussion about a specific sec section of the text. And you would not be allowed to express personal opinions. The conversation was only, what is the author trying to say? you disagree with people if they were misrepresenting the author's point of view. And you were only allowed to participate in the conversation if you had actually done the reading and marked it up. And every time that you raised your hand with a comment, you had to actually cite a quote and a page number. And we spent the whole class just having that kind of conversation. And then the next day, you'd be allowed to express your opinion. He said, after we spent a whole day just trying to establish what is the author saying, then the next day, you get to say if you agree or not. And so that's what was in How to Read a Book by Adler. And let's see if I can remember, there were only four types of criticisms you were allowed to levy at the author. You could say uninformed, uh, meaning, you know, there's some piece of information that they're not aware of, which if they were aware of, they'd come to a different conclusion. You can say misinformed, which is, um, you know, they think something is true when it's not true, and that's why their conclusion is wrong. Uh, you can say illogical. Uh, which is, oh, your conclusion doesn't follow from your premises. Or you can say incomplete, which is, well, what you said is true, but you're missing another part, which might be the most important part, or that shifts the emphasis dramatically. So uninformed, misinformed, illogical, or incomplete. When you criticize the author, you had to say which one of those you were doing and give your reason. This was one of my favorite classes ever, uh, if you can't tell, because uh, it was just such good practice for how to train your mind to be open to ideas, to try and read for understanding first and then to think about when you disagree why. What do you think you know and how do you think you know it? Um, so anyway, I'm not sure how long that was. I tried to make it go fast. Uh, I hope it was interesting. If any of those book, if there's any books in there that you'd love to see like a lot more about, uh, leave me a comment and I could do maybe a review of that book in particular. Um, and you know, there's other books out there that are awesome, so maybe I'll do another one of these one day. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this, and thanks for watching.